Hi, everybody. My name is Peter McPartland. I'm also from right here at UCI. I bet that at some point, everybody in here has told a little white lie, right? Probably felt a little bit guilty about it. I'm here to ask, what if, for science games and digital learning, lying can be beneficial? If so, where is the, where is the line? So right here at UCI, our School of Education, my team and I, we actually design our own scientific game. It's designed to teach eight-year-olds about the digestive system and gets them thinking about you know, systems thinking as they escort through food through the, through the body. So this bigger philosophical issue kind of came up for us when we were talking about how to represent what digestion looks like. You know, what, is it, what does it mean to animate what it looks like when food gets broken down? And eventually the question came up, is that, is that scientifically accurate? I mean, that right there, I get it, I get it. I, that represents food being broken down to me, but does it really explode into a bunch of tiny little pieces like that? And the response eventually came. If everything was scientifically accurate, kids would be watching blobs of food change in imperceptible ways for eight hours. <laughs> and this reminded us, right, that we're, we're not only trying to simulate accurate science, we're also making a game. So, as game designers, we believe that taking creative license and game mechanics, you know, can really enhance scientific understanding of kids. But at the same time, this little debate reminded us of an important balance that has to be struck. So, on the one hand, we don't want scientific accuracy, but boring. Nor, on the other hand, do we want something that's really visually appealing, but is kind of scientifically misleading. And that would be kind of counterproductive, right? So how do we go about trying to reconcile these two and figure out what we're doing? We felt that as educators, the priority takes precedence that we need to teach content accurately. But as game designers, you know, there are some el elements so critical to games that they're worth stretching the truth for a little bit. We came up with three elements for us. The first is agency. So experimentation is fundamental to science and understanding cause and effects. But for game design, it's even more fundamental. I mean, the, this audience that we have, we call them players, right? So on top of that, games should give us access to things that we have a tough time experimenting with in real life. So uh, like the question, can you breathe and swallow food at the same time? In real life, the phrase experimenting with choking brings up a couple of red flags. Uh, the issue here is that, as with a lot of scientific contexts, agency can be a bit of a lie. We are giving our players control over the entire digestive system here in real time, when in reality, once you get past chewing, you know, everything's kind of automatic. Um, so, if you believe in the power of games, you really do have to make room for agency in your game. It's just inherent. But let's make sure to limit it to some extent so that we're not allowing our players to bend things out of the realm of scientific possibility. Second up, we felt that it was really important to stress feedback. Very, very important for learning and adapting during gameplay. But point systems and gold stars, you know, they're, they're not always the best for complex scientific systems when you're dealing with eight-year-olds. So, for the stomach game, for example, it's, it's a complex web of cause and effect. We need our players to raise the level of acidity in the stomach in order to start digestion. Good. But that same action also starts the stomach wall burning in your body. Bad. In the end, we felt that we really had to convey these goals simultaneously by personifying our game elements. And this takes a lot more creative license than just a point system or gold stars. But for our eight-year-olds, it was just really intuitive. So be creative, but be sparing. We went through a lot of testing before realizing, you know what, we got to put smiley face body parts. Uh, the last thing you want, though, is for your creativity and too much to distract from learning. And finally, interest. This right here has got to be the most defensible reason to take a little creative license in your game. So it doesn't matter how much educational value it has or how solid it is, how much game structure, if nobody's interested in playing it. <laughs> right? I, I have cats. Uh, so everybody loves a good story of good versus evil, so we wove one through all the four stages of our game. Uh, we actually piggybacked off of our players' interest in these microscopic little guys, having them be the ones to give the rules, helpful hints, and advice. Um, so getting kids interested in science is very important, but eight-year-olds, it's so easy to blur the lines between fiction and reality. So be careful when you're introducing fictional characters, introduce them as fantastical elements. 
Ultimately, we believe there is a strong case to be made for lying for the sake of learning. Uh, you know, creative license and game mechanics should be used to enhance scientific understanding. But we should be aware of some uh, general guidelines to make sure we're not doing more harm. Thank you.